so the big funds, but now they're really big. Okay, let's uh, try this way. Uh, does anyone even know Swagger or OpenAPI? Okay, a few. So for all the rest is, yeah, rest. It's about REST APIs um, and a form of specification. So it's a spec of the, the REST API, which is supposed to be consumed by a client to automate things. Um, I did Im started to implement it because I was lazy to think of a known uh, thing to do validation and stuff. So we have here uh, the infamous pet store um, where I can make a um, So I have here a, a, it, Okay, it's based on the sync uh, HTTP framework and you write um, here the get method is for um, each REST call gets one class and if you implement the method get you have a HTTP get so usually you can um, too big now. So it's not, it's not really interesting. It's just that it, it looks at the you saw the pet store. There's on the, there's some instances on the glass side, and I'm just trying to get some objects. Okay. Um, the way is that sync is implemented as a URI space, which is a proper uh, idea. So you get one on the path, on the class side. You have a path method, and when you when you match the URL, um, the call the call is evaluated. So and I made an open API in URI space, which uh, turns every of these calls. You have some pragmas on the class side where you're saying um, for the get call for my pet store, I need in the path a parameter it should be a string, it should be constraints and stuff. So when the call is done, it's validated, but at the same time there is another call which takes all the classes and brings out the JSON spec, which is the open API. And what I wanted to show is the pet call experimenting from the, uh, from the command line, you see the JSON, and also I can do on uh, uh, Faro, I get per URL this spec, read it in an open API client, and then I just invoke the method with the parameters and the REST call is um, uh, serialized automatically and the response is evaluated. So it's kind of a RPC mechanism but you can apply on a real REST, RESTful um, web services. So, yeah, for everybody who wants to know in, in smaller fonts, ask me. Yeah. Thanks. And we have created a responsive web application for travel expenses. So why use the software for this? Each time you are on a business trip, you have expenses like hotel, flight, car rental, train, meals. And in Germany, we have the possibility to reduce our taxes if we create travel expense reports. So for example, I can get 216 euros tax-free for these. Often people are using Excel for this, but the legal guidelines in Germany change at least once a year, and so um, the Excel sheets are often outdated and wrong. Our aim, um, we try to make the application as easy to use for everyone, also for people who are not used to use web apps and the application is completely responsive so you can everything you do on the desktop also on mobile phones and on the tablet and I will just show this. What we use, we use Faro with Seaside as a database with MongoDB. We create reports with artifact and the PNGs from the reports with image magic and uh, Apache. On the front end, we have Material Design Lite, uh, OpenStreetMaps, Google Places, and some JavaScript. 
our infrastructure. We uh, have our servers at Amazon. We have a staging environment. We use GitLab for the issues and for the code with Iceberg. It works fine. And the staging environment is with uh, Docker. We are online since three weeks. First users found us. And the next steps are... Oh, I forgot to start the timer, so... The next steps are getting free feedback from the customers and from this develop more features and then create a licensing model because currently everything is free. And then we want to set up CI, CD and also automated test and testing for the... Um, for the uh, so, if you, after this presentation, want to have a look, just go on our landing page and register, it is free, and you can try it out by yourself. So, uh, because the application is responsive, <laughs> you see the tablet mode here. Okay. Um, you see um, the last five trips. I already started answering the data for Isaac, some summaries and charts. So I will continue entering Isaac. I have some base data here and I go through uh, one trip. I see Italy, switch to meals, it's currently it's everything in German. For example, I got breakfast each day, I add breakfast for Wednesday, I have some receipt, can add a new receipt, for example, taxi to social event. And from this I can create the PDF. The reports are created with artifact, but what you see here is just a PG, which is created from the PDF. And I can have a larger view here, and can switch through uh, the different reports here. So this is a small small uh, example. It's funny that I, I tested and um, now you see the tablet view and it works fine. <laughs> so, one last thing I want to show. Simulator, tablet, mobile. And if you cannot remember the URL, because Spesenfuchs, it's expenses fox, you can ask me and I can give you a card, so you can, you can try by yourself. So, my name's John, I work mainly with Dolphin Smalltalk at the moment. Um, how many people here use, or have used Dolphin? How many, yeah. how many people have heard of Dolphin? Oh, that's a little bit better. Okay, uh, so Dolphin is really nice uh, Windows native Smalltalk. Um, used to be a commercial product, it's now open source and that's um, hosted on GitHub so you can uh, download it from there and you can make your own fork and contribute back. Um, so I'm just looking at the Dolphin um, GitHub page there and there's the, the core libraries, uh, core classes and there's a bunch of uh, add-ons and a contributions repository as well. Um, that's my own set of repositories, my own work, and various ports I've done of stuff like Seaside. Um, so one of the, the downsides with having everything in GitHub is that at the moment um, the suggested way is to use something like SourceTree to 
pull down code, which isn't uh, that quick when you just want to get hold of one of the add-on libraries. So I've been looking for a, a better way to do that. So just looking at Dolphin itself now, um, one of the main tools is the package manager, and that lets you browse uh, all the loaded code in the different packages in the images, and obviously load additional ones from disk. Um, so what I've been trying to do is build something similar to work with the code that's hosted on GitHub. Um, so I'm doing this using the GitHub API, not working directly with Git. Um, and that just makes a series of REST calls to GitHub. Um, so when you initially open it, you get the, the core Dolphin repositories and your own repositories so you've got any, and you can add new ones using the context menu. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick demonstration of pulling something down from the contributions. Um, I'll pick something small because I'm not sure how fast my network connection is at the moment. So I'll pull in the complex numbers test and we can just very quickly select it, download and install it into the image. And I've got an error for some reason. Um, I'm not sorry. Um, so that's pulled in the complex test package and its prerequisite, which is the actual uh, complex package, and we should see those are now hosted directly in the image. Um, and you can then modify them as any other code in the image. And then there's also some uh, very simple uh, functionality to push your changes back into GitHub, although there's no diff or anything like that at the moment. Um, what I'd like to do ideally is extend this so that it becomes part of the Called Dolphin machinery. Um, that will let us do more sophisticated stuff like prerequisites that go across repositories, which it, it won't do at the moment. Um, and it's basically just geared towards trying to get a bit more engagement with Dolphin uh, by making it easy to use and easy to, to contribute to. Maybe a little from 7, which is actually overlay bindings for the compiler. So imagine that um, we have here, we evaluate a, sim a simple uh, piece of code, which is just foo, which would be normally a variable. But of course, foo is unknown in, in, the, in, in this code. But by defining a binding in the dictionary, which binds foo to the string hello, we can actually evaluate this code. And it uh, will return hello. Interestingly, it's actually built in, in a way that, it's, is, uh, that the bindings uh, are uh, shadowing the globals, so that means if we make a binding which is called objects, which uh, goes to order collection, then uh, we value an object new, which runs your order, order collection, just as a funny example. And the question is, of course, for what would you use this? So one idea is that it could be very interesting for, uh, for domain-specific languages and experiments. Um, but one thing that I actually built with this is uh, something that makes developing the compiler easier. And so the piece of code, ooh, how can I get this here? Yeah. So there is here uh, the piece of code which is called start using overlay uh, for development. And what it does is it actually creates uh, an overlay environment which lives in a class instance variable of uh, the compiler. And then we actually go through the package of the compiler, by just saying self package defined classes. And we put a copy of the class uh, into this overlay environment. So now we have a copy of the whole compiler class in one dictionary. Then we actually um, recompile all the classes in the overlay with the overlay itself being set, so here. Which means that after that, all the references to the compiler package itself will point to the uh, overlay environment's uh, version of, of the, uh, to the copied version. And then at the end, we uh, need to fix the superclass pointers, and then we make this uh, into the default uh, compiler for the image. So we say small dog image compiler class is now overlay environment at opal compiler. And so that means that now, from now on, the whole image uses this copy of the compiler and not the original compiler. And so that means that we can now put, uh, if we execute it, which I should not forget to do, so we can just click here. So now we created this overlay, 
And now we can actually put deep into the compiler, for example, in the method pass, we can put a halt. The first time, of course, not a problem, but the second time it should now halt because this is called for uh, actually compiling this, but it doesn't. So I can't kind of compile it again and nothing happens. And that means that I can now actually change the compiler as I want without touching the compiler that I use while working. Uh, but the tests are, of course, written in a way that they use the class directly, and so I can run the tests to make sure that I do not break anything, and then remove the overlay, and I'm done. So this is very helpful for developing the compiler. And I say, okay, with Faro.js, I developed this mobile application. And, but I didn't tell the whole story, so I take five minutes to, to give a glimpse of what's going on behind. So the main brick I use is something that is open source called Cordova. It's an Apache project. Formerly it was uh, called PhoneGap, and it was by Adobe, and it was released uh, open source. And basically, what Faro.js does, as you know, now it generates JavaScript, and we provide it as an input to, to Cordova, and Cordova will generate iOS app, the Android app, or whatever, even uh, Windows. Is anybody using Windows? But okay, they have plenty of targets. So. And so, this is, so the first brick is Cordova. But if we dig into the application, uh, the, I told you it looks and feels like native one. So there are uh, tabs, you have lists, uh, you have the, the, the map, you can have sliders. Uh, if you are on Android, you have a, a handling of the back button, of the, the, the system back button. So and if you are in iOS, the, the widget change. So you have more look and feel more to iOS. And this is more than formula. This is a widget library. There are many of them out there. I'm using one, one, one of them. Uh, and so to use it, so I have to use it. And besides, I have to use the device capabilities. Cordova provides the facility to, to use plugins. So we have a plugin for the Google Maps. We have a plugin for the sharing. If you access the camera, you have another plugin, notification, accelerometer, whatever. There are plenty, plenty of plugins out there. And to use all these, I had to implement uh, wrappers, extensions, facility code, and this is what is I call PhoneGap. It's a layer on top of Faro.js, so it's a, uh, a whole library that comes on top of a child project, I call it, on top of Faro.js. And uh, the next step will be to complete this work and to have the bridge working on actual devices. Currently, this is still incomplete. So the idea is to run the, 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 uh, the tests on the Faro image and to have the application running on actual devices. So this is uh, the, 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 the next target. So that's it for me. I to be said by a bridge between Faro and Ireland that I started to make. So, first I will talk about the motivation of doing this. Currently I'm working in this video game company. We are making a fighting video game for the PlayStation 4. My job in that company is to make the matchmaking servers. The matchmaking servers are the ones that used to provide the functionalities of Lois and QuickPay. In terms of business, in the best case, this kind of game they has about 17,000 concurrent con connections. That is a bad view for me, of course, because I need to handle all of that concurrency. So in my parents, we, they need to monitor and develop the service in production. I started to make them by using a combination of Python, PostgreSQL, and a C++ for the matchmaking server. It was a complete mess for in, in the C++ part of doing multi-trading with servers. I did a bad idea, so I moved into Erlang since May. So Erlang is a it's a language that was designed by Ericsson for programming telephone switchboard. It's purely functional, it uses an actor-based process model. It has a huge amount of concurrency, about more than one million of concurrent processes in a single machine, and that's a figure of uh, about five years ago. That's a really simple and powerful model for programming for tolerance applications, 
complete network classified C for doing uh, distributed programming. The Open Telecom platform is a series of libraries that runs on this language. Uh, I did a mistake in this slide. There's another language that runs in the same VM that is called Elixir and is used by, by Discord and some other big companies, RabbitMQ and, and WhatsApp, they are also programming in Erlang. So that's how we use the language, which we relate the, the meaning of that part. So for reading Erlang, so Erlang goes through the stream of, being, of making each object ser easily serializable. You can even serialize an Erlang function and send it to the network. They, they define aspects the format and so I'm just writing and that format from file and also parsing it. And open a socket and send commas encoded in that, in that form and then I just use the eval and I connect it with the GT tools. So it's how my tool looks. So uh, I already started the, the bridge in the Erlang side. You keep this about. So by doing this, I'm already connected to, to Erlang. And here I can see a list of all of the registered processes in Erlang. I can also open a payload with Erlang. So and, and I already have a, a really basic seat that's highlighting. So x equal one. In Erlang x actually is a pattern. I mean, e equals in Erlang is actually a pattern matching operator. So now I cannot do x equal two because they don't match. Ah, sorry, I, I had to finish x expression with that. With a uh, dot. That's an exception for Erlang. I also have all of the bindings here. This one here we have the x. Uh, let's say y. Uh, the x and y. X plus y. Right, right. I also expect it. We're going to remove a right here. Yeah. Now that works. Ah, of course that was for him. Yeah, let's say x also is true. Let's remove the value of x. Now we don't have that error. The whole value equals to 2. So now it's 4. Register gives me a list of all of the possibilities in Erlang that, that they receive an error. This is the same that I'm wrapping here in the frame, but I also wrapping this so you think to another in an error process that allows me to to do some conveniently the thing start like this. Like. Just to make sure I don't forget, um, before I run out of time, there's, there'll be a birds of a feather meeting about it. Um, tomorrow at 4 p.m. in the corner room. Please come. Um, the website, which is, which is what I'll be showing you right now, is at caffeine.js.org, and that's just a GitHub Pages site, um, and the repository for that website, including all the code we'll be seeing here, is at GitHub at this URL here. And I want to zoom out a little bit. Caffeine is uh, a project of mine that takes uh, Squeak.js, the virtual machine uh, for Squeak that Bert Freudenberg wrote uh, in pure JavaScript. And I add some things at the small talk level to make it uh, more comfortable to use um, inside a web browser or inside Node.js. So I've, uh, implement, I've taken the uh, two-way JavaScript bridge that is in Squeak.js and added a bunch of infrastructure around it so you can 
easily interact with the DOM around you if you're in a web browser and load other JavaScript frameworks and interact with them. So one example of a framework I've uh, uh, done a mashup with is uh, A-Frame from Mozilla, which is a VR framework. Um, so we're in a, an A-Frame world right now. Um, and I've made a plane object um, in A-Frame. And uh, one thing you can do with planes is project streaming video onto them. But I hacked it so that uh, display updates from Squeak.js VM uh, are being treated as video by this plane. So now I have a work surface, a virtual terminal inside uh, an A-frame VR world, world where I can use Squeak. Um, and I had to do a couple of other little things to make that work, uh, which I could do because I can interact with all the JavaScript objects around me just as if they were small talk objects. So, uh, that lets you uh, live code uh, anything in the JavaScript ecosystem that you want, which is what I would really like to do. Um, JavaScript is this great uh, live coding system that's in every web browser now. Um, it's basically a self system. It's an instance-based um, live object system. But the, the workflow that most people use when they build a web app is still uh, editing a bunch of uh, dead source code, spots, source code files in a text editor and then you know, bundling them all up with Webpack or whatever and spitting them out from a web server and then not, not interacting with it at all once it's actually reconstructed inside a client's web browser. I wanted to see how far I could push the approach of live coding all the time, so I'm always live coding in my web browser. Um, you know, this thing we're looking at now is just, uh, is just Chrome. Um, and this also works uh, in Firefox and Edge and Opera and Safari, both on desktop and mobile. Um, so a, a fun thing that you can do, you can come up to me later if you want to see it, is uh, run this on your phone and drop it into a Google Cardboard headset or whatever. And uh, you have a pretty easy way of doing uh, VR. Um, and I'm running a squeak uh, image here now, but this also, uh, this VM is an open Smalltalk VM. It runs COG images, even though it doesn't do native code generation by itself. Um, so it runs Squeak and Faro and Kuis also. Um, so yeah, please also come talk to me if there are some things uh, that you'd like to do in either of those systems, you know, live in the web browser. Um, so, um, while Squeak.js doesn't do, you know, really the really fancy native code generation that you would get in COG, it does take advantage of uh, the JavaScript engine that you're running on, whether it's V8 or whatever. Uh, it can identify uh, small talk methods that get run a lot, and then translate compiled method bytecode into very simplistic JavaScript that V8 can translate to native code very well. Um, so it's a sort of rudimentary JIT uh, that Bert wrote. Um, now, I'll just take the rest of my five minutes by showing you some other JavaScript frameworks that I've uh, uh, done integrations with. Um, this is one, one uh, presentation from the common press. So we recommend this one. I think that was like, the final uh, international convocation on June 14th, so after four years. And uh, uh, I will just show you uh, what, 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 what is a complex tier system with uh, XML files. So in, in, in uh, football, you don't need really software for results because maybe after one hour or 90 minutes, you have just zero, zero. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in France, it's it quite different. We already did it. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had uh, many, many pages of results in XML and recently we started in the international standards that standards groups uh, from which I was a member and uh, hopefully if the version don't interfere we'll publish it uh, quite soon and so we just start from our XML schema so uh, to generate the XML schema we need to use the oxygen XML tool and run the trunk uh, converter uh, to go from the XML to the schema to, to 
gets the abstraction. And then I had a number of tweaks to be able to, to get the schema correct. But it went on for 18 months of descriptions uh, on the international side because every, every vendor wanted to put uh, his own tweaks, of course. And so uh, then I used uh, just a uh, uh, generation for the small code. So, uh, and, and I have a visualization, visualization on my website. So I can just show you, um, uh, this is uh, actually this actual sh uh, standard shimmer. And what I do is, I, whenever there is modification, I a lot of them, I, I just uh, use a uh, visual works uh, binding and I do generate. Uh, so my marshal here has a shimmer which is on the website. More, with uh, really uh, minor tweaks, and then I just say I generate everything, from, and um, my package uh, goes uh, somewhere here. So uh, I have a, a bunch of classes which are generated automatically. And now uh, what I can do is I go to my website, which is here, and I have a lot an upload. Uh, if I want to, uh, I have a composition, I have I want to upload the results, so I just select the files. So it's here, uh, and I can shape it. So now I load it. Uh, oh. So it says it's a coded circuit, and uh, the size is. Uh, and now I can see what are the information, the screens, uh, the teams, uh, the results. And for instance, uh, this is uh, all uh, in SVG. So uh, um, and you can see, for instance, for this match, you can see uh, the, the details of the match. Everything is covered in the same and suicide and check and check your name about it. That's it. A little project that uh, I made last year, so I had a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem when working in a, uh, on Faroco because uh, so even if I use a Mac, I live in the terminal. And when I want to start working on a project, usually my starting point is the GitHub page from the project. And then I have a problem uh, deciding what to do in which order. So the usual workflow is that I am I start uh, happy, then I get a fresh image from your account, then I run it, then I go back to GitHub and copy the install instruction, meta and so on. Then I have to go back to Faro, open a workspace, then I paste and execute the loading instructions. Then hopefully it, it loads and I can try to focus and work a bit. And as it's bound to happen, I break the image. So, and you start from step one, do all the steps again, and of course it's, as it's bound to happen, you consider. So uh, usually at, at this point I feel really frustrated and I go back to sleep and give up, give up on computers altogether. Okay, so what I would like to do is, okay, you start from GitHub because that's where you discover the project usually. And then what I want to do is git clone, blah, 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 blah. And then run, start the project, just do it. Oops. So, Start by cloning a project of mine. Okay. And then I can just just run it like this. So ignore the the, the important part is that I can just run just do far run. And since I can, it will 
immediately execute uh, some uh, some code, and you're welcome to come to my talk on Thursday about that. You know what, what this does for me. Okay, so sort of okay. So anyway, don't, don't bother with the DRO. The point is, so I, I ran Paris twice, and you show that the, the, the second time I did it, it fetched the complete new image and tried and failed to load my code in it, but whatever. But it also made the backup of the, pre, the previous one. So if I, if I uh, uh, let's say I do a change, and I, or, I, or I try to load a new version of a, of a framework, I, uh, it's quite easy to just building a new image will not overwrite the existing one, uh, and I will still have backups to clean up afterward because they take uh, a lot of space. Okay. So. Uh, between my drinks, I uh, work uh, on a uh, day work, uh, which is a uh, Czech uh, website and its uh, backend is uh, completely in Faro. Uh, well, like 99% we have one uh, PHP file uh, nobody wants to touch. Uh, but uh, it's uh, based on a custom uh, web framework, so it's uh, on a C site or any uh, known one. Uh, actually, it started as a master thesis of uh, Michal Balda over there. And uh, now uh, it is uh, online uh, on uh, daywork.cz uh, and uh, there is um, something about uh, 4,000 uh, users. Uh, and uh, it's a website for, uh, for um, like finding uh, temporary uh, jobs uh, or uh, finding uh, workers for those temporary jobs. It's mostly focused on students, as you can see, everything is in uh, Czech, uh, but uh, it uh, works quite fine and uh, we can uh, actually uh, find uh, find uh, jobs suitable for uh, any, uh, any student. Uh, so a student uh, registers, uh, he creates a profile and uh, writes something about him, but uh, not just the text, but uh, measurable, uh, uh, comparable uh, options. And uh, when the company creates a job, uh, they uh, add uh, similar uh, similar properties, and uh, our system uh, finds uh, the right jobs uh, for the uh, right people. And uh, this is uh, just a, a 
quick uh, quick overview of some of the code. As you can see, uh, these are uh, classes of the element which is that uh, web framework. Uh, actually, I recently published it uh, to the to the GitHub. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any link leading to that, but if you find my name, uh, which is uh, quite hard itself, it's Jan Blizničenko, okay, repeat after me. Um, you can find uh, both Querier and Eleven, which are both frameworks uh, made originally by Michal Valda. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so today I'd like to show you integration for my method and small talk. Uh, it's a data talk, uh, development environment for a formalized education language called uh, VDMSF. Uh, that's a build on top of Faro. So the point is uh, to bring a uh, meme of live programming of some small talk community into formal method community. So, okay, this is uh, just a simple specification. That, okay, there we go. That, uh, this is just a simple counter. Uh, it has uh, two variables. One is a uh, current value of count and uh, it's maximum value. And uh, there's the uh, invariant constraint that the uh, system always has to satisfy with its internal state. That saying a uh, count value should not exceed the value of maximum value. Okay? So this, uh, this kind of you know, constraint that have to keep at a runtime is a kind of you know, characteristic or you know, strong point strength of formal method comparing to a programming language like Smoto. So I can okay, show you how to run it. So there is uh, some function named uh, increment. It's just increment the value. It's simple. Doesn't check anything. <laughs> And it out. And the other is decrement, just count to minus one, very simple. And also have some get the current value and reset, those kind of functions. Okay, I can try how increment works. Now count is set to zero and max maximum is set to three. And I can okay, select here and print it. Now it's a one. And uh, see the uh, state is changing. And also try a uh, second time. Oops. And also can try a uh, third time. And then next. Oops. So. Something more. So uh, this is kind of you know they're using uh, the execution is they are uh, using the uh, external interpreter for a VDM. And uh, Vienna Talk provides an integration with Smalltalk by automatically generating uh, Smalltalk classes from this specification. For so I choose uh, use transpiler mode, then it's all already using a uh, transpiler. So I can say uh, increment get two and increment get three and increment then I get a uh, notification. This is small talk. And by seeing the inside okay this is a whole start. And uh, here, the uh, small talk code generated from the specification, but uh, here is the VDM button 
If I click on this, I can see what part of the specification is being executed to, to you know, corresponding to the current uh, program counter of the small dot virtual machine. So internally, this is you no know, uh, executing the uh, bytecode of this, and uh, with the small dot view, uh, this is executing this part of small dot code, generated small dot code, and I can see. The, uh, this small talk was originally generated from this specification so that uh, I can debug a, uh, okay, here is the uh, code and I see this, at this time the violation happens so I can set the, uh, oops. So I assigned the smallest one on the picture. <laughs> Which is not bad from the Dalton point of view. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, this is a fun joke so much. Okay, so discussing with some of uh, some of you, uh, I had the idea to do uh, an update of the framework. So why we did the framework? So if we look at it as hiring some new small talkers is not so easy today. If we want to answer to the question. Um, for example, especially for us, we want to recruit some new PhD students and we say in the subject, yeah, you will do some experiments in a nice, cool language. Small talk. <laughs> okay. So, we have to attract new blood in the community and to be attractive and make the community grow. And our answer is the framework. So, how to attract new people and make things cool. So what is the, the framework? If we look at it inside the MOOC, we have seven weeks of lectures. We have 60 lectures. Inside the lectures, there are the slides, there is a video, there are some quiz, and uh, we have some live videos. So live, it means that it is a demo of the system, and then we explain how to redo things and things like that. And we have some exercises, we have some challenges, so we have a lot of materials like that and a uh, uh, mini project that we improve a lot uh, for the, section, coming, the coming session. Uh, all of that is in multiple languages. So it's in English, all supports, and videos, there are subtitles, but for English there are also a voiceover with native English speakers, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> And uh, we also have it in French, it was much easier. We have some Spanish subtitles, thanks for uh, the people that did it. We also have some Japanese subtitles, and I would like to thank Tomoyo. Thank you very much. So like that, I'm really happy to make people believe that I can, I can teach in, Sp in, in Japanese. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and what we have else in the MOOC, we have some profiles. So we define, we have a lot of lectures, so this is something that is big, and we define some different profiles, so it's not mandatory to do everything. You can do, okay, I'm a newbie, and I want to learn. So I just selected the materials for the newbie pass. Or I would like to look for web stuff, and then they are complementary. So you have to choose the, the right combination of paths you want to do. If you want to, to do some black magic and reflective stuff and learn advanced stuff, this is possible. Uh, of course, in all the slides, if we look at it, at the end there is a license. This is Creative Commons. So it means that you can reuse this material, you can download it, you can share it, etc. So, the retrospective is that we did the first session in 2016 with 3.5k uh, uh, participants and 3.5k uh, uh, participants in the session 2 and 75% uh, uh, did it for fun and most of them as a master degree so it means that okay we can attract people Cool. I would like to attract, I don't know, one person each year to be perfect. 
And we have some great testimonies, so I let you read. I particularly like the latest one. This is my favorite. <laughs> so thank you. If you have some questions. And uh, I have actually two, two, two things to show, but it will be super quick because everything is documented. <laughs> uh, so the first one is a migration tool from Smalltalk Hub to GitHub, uh, which is uh, very important because we have now iceberg and everything. Uh, so what this tool does is it takes your entire Smalltalk Hub history, all the MCZ files, and replace this history into commit into Git. So you get for each MCZ file you get a git commit and everything is preserved, you can track it, etc. Uh, we, we now moved, uh, for example, Russell, which was several thousands of commits and uh, dozens of uh, contributors. Uh, also, one of the nice things is that uh, in MCZ, you can actually have multiple authors, even if the committer was someone else. Uh, so this information is also preserved. And in fact, it's also preserved if a intermediary MC that is missing, which is very common for languages like this. Uh, so you can just uh, Google it, so git migration, or uh, there are links all over the place, install it. Uh, don't try it on Fire 6. Uh, I, I'm not going to report everything. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, just so information, you can basically just copy this uh, for your information and run it and it will be done. Uh, there are also some, yeah, it's a lot of text. There are some, also some visualizations if you want to look uh, at your history, what kind of commits there are, uh, what is missing, and etc. Et this is, for example, a couple of packages from Polymath. So there are different uh, colors depending on uh, which uh, MCs that are missing and how to deal with that, etc. Uh, so this is the first thing. Uh, the second one is called uh, Pharocentric. I, if you are familiar with uh, Sentry, which is like a, let's say, uh, server or like a service, uh, a SAS, SAAS uh, solution uh, for tracking uh, bugs in runtime, uh, it's a very nice environment. Uh, so uh, I uh, wrote a bindings library. Uh, so uh, let's say that you have some. Uh, you execute some code and it raises an exception uh, so you can just say that you want to capture this exception and send it to some remote server and on the remote server uh, you of course can see this uh, silly textual representation but that's very practical uh, so you can also look at the actual lines etc provide additional in runtime information versions uh, variable values will come dot uh, at least for me, it's been extremely helpful uh, for dealing with uh, desktop deployments uh, for multiple customers and seeing all the issues come and being able to uh, very quickly uh, resolve it. Uh, there is also a kind of binding for Beacon, so you can use a special logger that when something happens, when a message is emitted, it uh, uses some tree. Uh, there is, this is just a short readme, but there is a, a larger documentation that contains almost everything that Sentry supports. Uh, so you can look at it and maybe make sense of you use it. That's all. Thank you. You have never heard of this. This is uh, called Missile. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Of yeah. course, the cool things know this. But it's, a, it's kind of a horror for most of the people who look at it. <laughs> um, it's called Resource Description Language and came from the idea that everything on the web, which is reachable through an URL, should, be, should have metadata describing that resource on the web. Um, <clears throat> and it's kind of the, the basic block for the semantic web, the Tim Berners-Lee um, vision. And, um, I just implemented it, so I, I like this kind of stuff, so I did it, and I just 
like to show you why. <coughs> so, um, okay, so I did this PDF, PDF stuff, right? So let's just open a little the explorer, so we look at the PDF. <coughs> So, PDF can have major data. See my here. And it's ugly uh, XML, right? So, you can reform it a little bit so that it's nicer. And um, what you see is description to describe this document. So this particular document is actually a PDF with some XML as attachment, which describes the bill. So in this thing, there's a lot of stuff in there. And for example, here's some information describing what the attachment is about. So you don't need to interpret the whole PDF. You just need the metadata and know what's, what's in there. So this way of describing metadata is called XMP extendable metadata platform or whatever. It's actually an ISO standard that comes from Adobe. And you see that, well, if you see that, you see that everywhere. So, for example, photos, videos, PDFs, whatever, is annotated with that. So, with your photos, you have EXIF. That's XMP, actually. And XMP is RDF. So, I need XMP because PDF version 2 will have a uh, requirement to have these metadata in XMP in it. So, of course, I could do it easily, just some XML and guess some things, but I like to do it right. So, right means implement RDF first. So, I didn't do XMP yet, so that's the next project. But RDF is ready. And um, so, just an idea what RDF is about. Um, you basically have statements about something, about the resource you're describing. So it's always a three-part thing with a subject, a predicate, and an object. So this, in this thing here, the nodes are, predicate, uh, are subjects or objects, and the edges are predicates. Most of them are URLs. So that means these predicates come from so-called vocabularies, which are described on the left. So this, there are some, some famous um, vocabularies like friend of a friend or Dublin Core for describing uh, books in a library or something. Um, so, and with this, you can build this graph because these nodes of the subject or the objects can form the graph and you can describe anything. So, anything we can describe with objects, we can also describe with RDF. <coughs> so, where is it used? For example, Wikidata. So I took Barack Obama because he has a lot of data. So Wikidata is something where everybody can just put facts about things in there. And it's so sort of like pictures and movies and whatever, and spelling of names in different, oh, something nice at the bottom here, names in all kinds of languages. And it's kind of cool. So you can even download this data. And when you do that, you end up with something like this. So this is RDF big big XML, right? So, now comes the boring part, because I downloaded this, and this file is, let's see, ah, uh, <laughs> uh, All right, so what I'm gonna show you here is a really short demo uh, following the, the talk small talk of uh, Norbert about uh, Open API <laughs> and the presentation of this morning uh, we have about uh, our Docker Swarm and Fire Images. So what I'm going to try to uh, to do today is to have a, to dive into our uh, Docker Swarm uh, from Faro. So we have, uh, we use an API called the Docker Engine API and luckily this API has been done with open API. It means that from the spec file, we can here, 
we can have a, we can generate a open API client and actually a, a Docker Swarm client. And uh, what we decide to do now from Docker Engine is uh, we will represent it using Rosal. So what we have here on the yeah somehow um, we have the nodes, uh, three of them. Can I see it better? Yeah. And here are the tasks uh, in the node. So in the Docker Swarm task we have one container. So basically the container. So there I. Um, I so it's done simply here. So when we have the inspector, we have some Rosal code, and uh, that calls the client that will get the nodes. So here you can see the Docker engine uh, call to get the node list. So this is just a first first start, but that's what we aim to know that we are our cluster. So this was actually the our alpha version, our alpha cluster. Now we have this. We want to be able to yeah maintain it and play with it from far. So we are open for anything. Thank you. So I will present the tool I made um, that make uh, second second generation. In this world. Not in Faro this time. But I will port it to Faro. So it works very easily to select what part of the code you want to execute and to add in your diagram. You say, I want to generate a second diagram. You say, the package you want to instrument. So it's a test, so I would like to instrument this one. I have some transformer to make the diagrams a bit better. Just press OK. So it makes the, the props around the, around the test we want to start. We start the test. It really is a test. So it's a real uh, test of lab code. The test is done in passing. And after we go to here and it generates sure no machine. It's better. And it generates a second diagram of what happened during the test. So we got all the methods that have been involved and what happened during the execution of the test. So it's very helpful for LAM and people to see what's happening and to debug and understand the problem. Thank you.